Okay, now let's talk about the flip side. The flip side, of course, of future value, the inverse of future value is present value. And so in present value, what we're talking about is how to think about uh, what's going on, uh, what we have now, and how to think about how that might change at some point in the future. So we have the same formula here. All we've done is rearrange some little, a little algebra to rearrange so that present value is on the left-hand side by itself. And the formula for present value says that the present value of some amount has to be equal to the future value divided by one plus the rate, the rate, all of that raised to the number of periods that the investment exists, right? So again, should look really similar. Present value and future value, these are formulas that are gonna be on your formula sheet for the exam, so it's not something you have to memorize. Of course, your exams are online anyway, so that's not a big deal. You'll be able to see those. You'll have, you'll, you can write down all your formulas there. Um, uh, so uh, what is important here, though, is that we, uh, we think about how these formulas actually play out, how all of these inputs interact with each other to cause changes in the present value or the future value. Okay. Now, the terminology that we use and practice to talk about present value and future value uh, is a little bit different. Um, when we're talking about future value, we often say that some amount that we invest now gets compounded into the future, right? Remember compounding is the act of combining two things. So compounding means getting larger by adding additional uh, material. And that's what's happening when we take some amount and we invest it we are adding the interest or the rate of return over time and slowly getting larger, right? So the difference between a present value, the investment now, and the future value is compounding and that's always getting larger. Now, the flip side, when we talk about the present value of some future amount, we call that discounting. So if I say, I hope to have a million dollars in the future, what do I need to have now? Well, what I want to do to figure that out is I want to discount that million dollars. Remember discounting, just like a discount on a store means taking something off. Discounting means I want to remove all of the compound interest that would occur in my investment over however long I, the investment lasts so that I can figure out what I need to start with, right? And so the, this terminology is super, super common. You're gonna hear it all the time. I'm gonna use it all the time in this class. So if I say compounding, what I mean is we want to look at the future value of some amount. Or we wanna look at the effect of the compound interest on the way to that future value. And if we say discounting, or if I say discount something, what I'm asking you to do is take some future value and calculate its present value. Remove the effect of all the compounding so that we see what we actually have in the present and what we need to start with to get to where we're going, okay? so. The relationships here are fixed. The present value is always less than the future value, and the future value is always greater than the present value, right? Because compounding is a positive effect and discounting is a negative one. Okay, uh, let's jump and work some present value examples here. Again, we'll start with a formula example, uh, and uh, we'll work a couple more, and then we'll jump into uh, uh, a calculator example here. Uh, and we'll work that same one using the calculator so that we start to get a feel for the calculator. Um, and we'll work a couple more examples here uh, where we, uh, we talk about the relationship between all the different inputs. Okay? Something I think is really important is that not only do you just remember or memorize how to plug things into the calculator, but that you also have a really good understanding of why all of these things happen. What happens, for instance, if we earn more money? Is my, so I start with $100. What happens to my future value if my rate goes up? I'd like you to be able to have an intuitive understanding of the process so that you can answer me and say, if we earn more money on our initial investment, we should have a higher future value. If we earn less money, we should have a lower future value. If I have a longer length of my investment, I should have a higher future value. And if I have a shorter length of my investment, I should have a lower future value. I have less time for all that compounding to get me to a better future value, right? So we'll spend some time talking in these examples here about those relationships and how I hope you 
understand those relationships because I think they're really important. And there's certainly going to be some opportunities on the exam for you to answer questions more quickly or more easily if you remember these relationships and don't have to calculate all the answers. Okay. So again, jump out, watch these present value problems. Again, the, the example problems are pretty quick. Uh, jump out, watch them, work them, then come back and we'll keep talking. Okay, now, just like with any other formula, right, in mathematics, the important thing uh, about solving for one of the inputs is that I know the other inputs, right? So, in other words, I can only solve, if I have one equation, I can only solve for one unknown thing. Which means that if I want to know the present value, given the formula, I need to know the future value, the rate, and the number of periods. And if I want to know the future value, then I have to know the present value, the rate, and the number of periods. But that's not always what I'm interested in, just the present value or the future value. In fact, sometimes what I'm more interested in is what's the rate that I need to earn to go from some amount that I have now, what I know, I know I have $10,000 to invest. I know I want to retire with a million dollars. How do I turn 10 into a million? Well, the way that I figure that out is I try to figure out how much time I have. So maybe I need to know the length of time in that investment. Or maybe I know how much time until I want to retire. I want to retire in 40 years. So what I want to know is what's the rate that I would have to earn in order to make that possible. So sometimes I want to solve for I or I want to solve for N. And luckily, again, algebraically, there's no difference here. There's no difficulty. I just rearranged the formula and I solve for I on one side or I solve for N on one side. Now, the rearranging of those formulas is more complex when I want to solve for I or N particularly because i is inside of an exponential function and n is the exponent in the exponential function. So the formulas are more complicated and I'm not going to show them to you here uh, in the lecture uh, because we have the calculator and simply with the calculator we can simply just plug in all the inputs and then compute the other option, right? So we can solve for i or n in a very straightforward way. Now, we're going to work some uh, calculator problems here so that you get more familiarity with the calculator. Again, in the example problem, I'm going to ask you to try and solve these uh, without looking at the solutions first, just to see if you get a good feel for it. Uh, but please go ahead and solve. There's some present value, future value problems here. Jump to the example video. Um, and uh, then we're going to have another example video here where we talk about the difference between compound and simple interest. Again, this is a uh, is, this is intended just to give you an idea of the power of compound interest. It's not that you're likely to see simple interest problems or simple interest contracts or be offered a simple interest loan or anything like that, but it is a good illustration of just how powerful compound interest can be, uh, and, and especially, particularly when it's working for you, like in your retirement account. Okay. Now, here's some problems where we're going to solve for the rate. Again, we're just using the calculator here, so jump to the example video where we work these two problems solving for the rate. And, uh, and then the last thing that I want to talk about here, uh, either before you jump away or right as you come back, is a, is a nifty little rule having to do with the rate, uh, something that we call the rule of 72. And this is something I'm, I'm not going to test you on it or, or ask you about it. It's a really cool just uh, back of the envelope way to sort of keep in your back pocket uh, and what the rule of 72 does is give you a very general idea of how long it should take to double your money in an investment. And so what that means is, let's say I want, I have a thousand dollars and I want to know if I put it in the stock market, approximately how long is it going to take for me to get to 2000? Because that's kind of a useful metric. It's also like a very uh, intuitively behaviorally appealing measure. Like, oh, I doubled my money. Great. Okay. The rule of 72 says approximately divide 72 by the rate that you're earning and the answer will be about how many uh, about how many years or about how many periods depending on what kind of rate you used if you used an annual rate it'll be about how many years it'll take you to double your money now this is really common it's really it's really used really often by people uh, they probably don't say that they're using it but it's a really cool and nifty little rule okay now just like solving for the rate, we can use the calculator to solve for the number of periods in. Uh, the, the main things you need to be careful with uh, when you're solving for rate or in, and uh, of course I go over these in the example videos, but the main things you need to be careful with 
are that the uh, that you make sure that you are accounting for the correct compounding period. Okay, so if it's annual, then everything needs to be in an annual period. If it's monthly, then everything needs to be converted to a monthly period. So you have a monthly rate, you have a number of months. If it's annual, you'll have an annual rate and a number of years. Okay, so that's the biggest trip up for people in, the, in this and working these problems initially until you get used to them is making sure that you identify the correct rate. I mean, the correct compounding period. Okay, so again, I'll talk about that a lot in the example videos and, and you can work the videos for the rate here and for the number of periods. Uh, there are separate videos up here, so please jump there. Uh, now, the rest of these, uh, the rest of the slides in this chapter are just more examples. Uh, normally, we do them all together in class. Uh, they are, of course, there are videos to work it. There are solutions here. I strongly encourage you to try to work all eight of these problems without looking at the solutions first. If you can do them all without looking at the solutions, then you're ready for the exam on this chapter. If not, then you know where you need to study. And if you have any questions, please reach out. We can talk about it on Zoom. I can point you at any of the any number of uh, the tutoring classes that are offered by the university. Uh, maybe you can we, we can get you in contact with a previous student or uh, somebody else in the class. If you've got a friend who feels like they have a better grasp of the situation, but this material right here, chapter five and six, is absolutely central to the rest of the class. And remember, there's only this chapter and then chapter six, and then we have our first exam. So the first exam is going to be a huge part of it is going to be covering this material. So not only will you need it in a couple of weeks for the first exam, but you're going to you have a strong need for it uh, throughout the rest of the class. So this is the part where I tried to warn you in the beginning not to fall behind. So if you feel like you're not getting this material, please reach out sooner than later. And we can, I can give you more problems. We can talk about the things that are confusing you. Uh, and we can make sure that you get this stuff before we move on and before you take your first exam. Um, okay, so that's all I have for chapter five. Uh, chapter six is a continuation of this. Uh, we are simply in chapter six, we're gonna add the idea of intermediate payments, meaning instead of just having a future value and a, and a present value, we're also gonna talk about what happens if you have uh, intermediate time payments, inter intermediate time periods where payments are made. So for instance, you have a credit card and then you pay off the bill every month, or you have a retirement account that you contribute to your investment every month. Okay, a more realistic, more real world example. The math gets a little harder, but the calculator, nothing changes at all. We've got that fifth button for payment and we just incorporate that. Okay, we'll see you next week.